I know, I'm getting text messages too, guys. I apologize. All right, so our Facebook is good. And then now we're just checking our YouTube. Brother Manny is going to be checking that to verify for us. <clears throat> All right, I see it. Still nothing? Yeah, it's on. Yeah, it's on. It's on? Yeah, I got it. Okay. Brother Manny, you got that? Amen. Glory to God. Well, we just want to welcome everybody on back here to Simple Faith Baptist Church. Where the Bible changes us, we do not change the Bible. I sure do apologize uh, for those of you that are online. Uh, we were having a lot of technical difficulties this evening, 22 minutes worth. But we're not going to waste any more time. Uh, for those of you who know, we tried our best to advertise uh, tonight's midweek Bible study. A lot of our in-house brothers and sisters, uh, by the grace of God, were able to make it. So all of our church here, everybody say hi. Yeah, amen, amen, amen. There's everybody there in the house. And uh, we want to welcome everybody that is watching us online today. Uh, I'm just going to quickly introduce our speaker to a little bit. Uh, and so we have tonight for us, uh, all the way from Deland, Florida, for those of you who don't know in-house, Brother Ed Worth. He is the uh, office uh, slash church manager slash evangelist slash professor uh, teacher there for the Deland School of the Bible. A great friend of mine. I befriended him about three years ago uh, after I transitioned out of my former church converting to becoming a Bible believer, and uh, this brother became uh, real close to me over the years, virtually, because we didn't meet until Kwamein and I flew out there to a Bible conference on uh, just helping me and guiding me, mentoring me through uh, theology and independent Baptist uh, theology, but most importantly, believing the King James Bible and making choices, and uh, he was there for me through a lot of that time. I've always looked up to him since uh, he has a YouTube channel called KGB Bible Scope, has a lot of great books that he's gone through verse by verse exposition and uh, so when brother Kwame and I had the opportunity to fly out there uh, by God's grace we had the opportunity to meet each other and uh, it sure was a blessing to finally uh, to get together he just they welcomed us like family uh, we stayed with some members there we had a car that brother Ed let us use brother Q and I and uh, we hung out with the gunnies it was a blessing uh, so with that said I've, I've asked him to share the word of God with us today months ago uh, tonight is going to be a good introduction on a really good topic of the Bible, uh, the begotten doctrine of, of uh, Jesus Christ and where the Bible teaches that, firstborn, begotten, and the significance. And uh, so today I hope you're blessed with the message. And if we do have any more technical errors, don't worry, we're hoping to get through them today. Uh, so just stick it out with us. If the video is not as good, just listen to the audio. That's what is going to be most important for us uh, today is listening to what's going to be spoken and taught. And uh, so without further ado, let's go ahead and welcome up Brother Ed virtually, amen, all of us in house. And uh, Brother Ed, we're giving you some, uh, some hand claps from the members here. And then uh, for those okay. who are in online, again, just tune in and, uh, and we're going to uh, now uh, give it over to Brother Ed. And Brother Ed, before uh, you preach, and uh, I know you're uh, three hours, amen, he's on uh, Eastern Standard Time, Florida, we're in Oceanside Pacific. Uh, so we sure are going to hook him up with a love offering and some energy drinks. I'm going to Amazon deliver them over there for him. Amen. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, as you get started, Brother Ed, if you can just share with us a little about your, your testimony and then uh, a little bit about how we befriended. And then uh, if you can get into the doctrine, Brother Ed, I appreciate it. So just take your time uh, as much as your, uh, your body allows you to. I know it's a little bit later, uh, and uh, we sure will be blessed. So go ahead, Brother. <laughs> okay. Uh, do appreciate uh, Brother Carlos. Um, inviting me out uh, to be able to speak with you via uh, internet. I don't, I have never done it this way before. Um, I have did some Q and A's this way, but never uh, doing a sermon, but I do appreciate an opportunity, any opportunity that I can get to be able to present uh, the word of God, the Holy Bible to a lost and dying world, as well as uh, saved members of the body of Christ. Uh, we all need work every day in our lives. Uh, in the word of God, I don't think we get enough word of God in our lives every day. We get maybe, uh, you know, a midweek service, uh, sometimes uh, uh, the morning service and the evening service on Sundays. But really, is that enough Bible that we ought to get, uh, you know, in a whole week? Uh, the world is working on us seven days a week. We ought to be working in the Bible seven days a week and perfecting our lives for Jesus Christ every single one of those days. 
I understand we have to be in the world, but we don't have to be of the world. So uh, we we all, including myself, would do well to uh, stay as close to the word of God as we can in obedience to the Lord. And I do appreciate uh, Brother Carlos inviting me out to be able to speak with you guys a, a, a sermon as well. Um, he wanted me to touch up on the the time that we met uh uh seems like uh there's an audio problem there carlos i don't can it can everybody hear me fine okay you're good okay so me and brother carlos uh when i think he was leaving a church and he had called me and uh was wanting some direction and i did my best with what i knew at the time uh Every, everything Carlos told me about uh, his situation. And I did my best with, uh, you know, using the Bible verses and uh, practical application to be able to direct him the best way I knew how. And uh, I'm telling you, he took that information and he really uh, held it as genuine information to be able to help himself out of his predicament. And by obedience in the word of God, I saw uh, brother Carlos uh, grow grow and grow, uh, you know, through the time period that I've, I've known him over the years. And here he is uh, today, praise the Lord. And uh, we became good friends, uh, a lot, uh, mainly over talking on the phone. I mean, uh, him asking questions and me doing my best to give him an answer. And if I didn't have the answer, I could talk with my pastor uh, about, you know, his situation. And uh, again, doing our best to be able to help uh, you know, brother Carlos out and, uh, what a great thing, you know, uh, the church has started and, uh, he's got you guys there. Praise the Lord. Uh, the church is growing. And I, I really appreciate when I hear testimonies from Carlos, when he calls me about the church. So praise the Lord for that. Um, I am not sure if anybody can hear me right now. I'm going to keep going. I mean, I don't see Carlos on the screen anymore, but I'm going to just keep going. I'm just going to ride this out. And I guess Carlos will let me know either uh, through the Zoom or through the phone app or, or through the phone. He can just call me or text me. Uh, okay, I see. I see Carlos there. Okay. He's saying everything's good. So uh, that's just a little bit of me and Carlos. Uh, it's not intricate. It's not in detail. I mean, certainly there was a lot of, of issues we were dealing with in the scriptures uh, as far as me explaining and Carlos giving some great questions that he was asking uh, the whole time and uh, always uh, always had a humble heart, humble spirit when, when he talked. Uh, I mean, he may have been full, persuaded about certain things, but he was always willing to uh, get correction from the word of God, the King James Bible. So I really appreciate that, a real humble spirit. And a lot of times people say they're humble spirits, but they're they're really not. I mean, if you end up touching up on their little pet doctrine, then, you know, obviously, you know, they're, they're going to argue with you and uh, cause uh, division within your fellowship. Um, but Carlos, you know, he said, you know, like, I don't care about what anything, what I believe, I just want to be right with the word of God. And that is a real refreshing uh, way to approach you know, even if you've already learned uh, for many, many years, as Carlos did, uh, but he was willing to reanalyze everything he've ever he's ever believed and willing to line his life up with rightly divided Bible teaching, which was uh, really a huge blessing because I don't normally deal with folks like that. I normally get the arguments and then they hang up on me on the phone or they uh, they email me and we're emailing for weeks and weeks and weeks and nothing's ever accomplished. But um I think uh, Carlos is definitely, praise the Lord, on the right track. I've heard Carlos uh, preach many times and uh, great doctrine, great sound teaching. I do appreciate Brother Carlos, and uh, and I, I really uh, thank him for his testimony. Uh, it's really affected us here at the Bible Baptist Church. Uh, Pastor Knox uh, asks many times about uh, Brother Carlos and the the uh, uh, Simple Faith Baptist Church and how uh, all of you are doing. And we do pray for all of you over there. And uh, we are thankful for uh, your consistency in preaching the word of God uh, to a lost and dying world in evangelism out on the street. So praise the Lord. Praise the Lord for that. So other than that, I'm going to go ahead and get started uh, with the sermon 
and yeah, there's just some something really wrong with the audio from the YouTube that my wife is saying. But I just uh, let you know that I don't. You probably, you guys probably can hear me fine uh, there, but there may be a problem going out to YouTube. So let's go ahead and get started. If you would um, open up your Bible to John chapter three, John chapter three in the Holy Bible. So we're going to start in verse 13, John chapter three, verse 13. <clears throat> Give you a little bit of time to turn there. <clears throat> John chapter three, verse 13. <clears throat> And the Bible says in John 3, 13, Jesus Christ is talking. Um, he had just been dealing with Nicodemus, uh, starting in verse 1 on down. And then John 3, 13 says, And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. You see that? Now, I want you to pay attention to this. Uh, it's Son of Man. Do you see where it says Son of Man? Now, uh, there's other truths we could get from John 3.13. Uh, one, for instance, and we're not going to go down this road. It'd be more of a rabbit trail. But Jesus Christ was on earth when he said John 3.13. And yet he's saying, I'm in heaven just as I am on earth, which means 1 John 5.7 is absolutely true. There are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. How can Jesus Christ, being in a human body of flesh, be one with the Father as he's speaking on earth to us, uh, as well as Nicodemus there? How, how can he be on earth and in heaven and the truth be that they are one? G Jesus Christ and God the Father are one. So this, uh, and this, just to help you out, because we're de definitely, when we cover this uh, topic, begotten, uh, it's definitely a profitable uh, word that we can use, rightly divided in the Bible, to be able to show the errors of cults and different denominations and religions that would misrepresent who Jesus is in the body of flesh, as well as being fully God. So I want you to pay attention to a few, a few of these things as we read down. So son of God in verse 13. Now look at verse 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the, now, now, now key in on this, son of man be lifted up. So you see in verse 13, son of man, verse 14, son of man. Now look at verse 15. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have, now pay attention to these words here, eternal life. Okay, so we covered son of man in verse 13, son of man in verse 14, eternal life in verse 15. Now look at verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his what? Only begotten son, not son of man, only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Nope, doesn't say that. It says everlasting life. So I want you to key in on this, but uh, everlasting life, eternal life, son of man, and then son of man in verse 13. And also in verse 16, be only begotten son. See that? Now verse 17 does it again. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So we've got son there again. Now look at verse 18. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. Why? Because he had not believed in the name of the, now look, here it is again, only begotten son of God. Do you see that? So what we're keying in on right now in this study of begotten is verse 18, begotten son of God, verse 17, his son, verse 16, only begotten son, 15, eternal life, and 14, son of man, 13, son of man, and we cannot forget 16, everlasting life. So a lot of stuff there, a lot of jumbled up stuff. I know, you know, I'm not trying to confuse you, but you're going to see how all of these things that we're talking about are going to tie together with the doctrine of begotten. 
Okay, so just a few things on the outset before we get started. First of all, we're going to pray. Uh, let's go ahead and pray. Dear Holy Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace, your mercy, your love to us. Please bless your word this evening. Give us understanding. Uh, take away my flesh. Take away my understanding, Father. Let's go to your word and honor you in rightly divided teaching according to your only begotten Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Please bless this sermon in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. Well, Let's start off with a few things on the outset, and you'll see we're going to come right back to John 3, and I'm going to cover a lot of these truths in more detail. So having the right Bible is vitally important to correct truth and doctrine in the Bible. Isaiah 34, 16 states, seek ye out the book of the Lord and read, which means there's only one book of the Lord. There aren't many books. You can't find the word of the Lord all over the place if all these other books are contradicting each other. So God is a God of truth, not a God of contradiction. So 2 Timothy 2.15 deals in studying. Now, this is us studying for what purpose? To show ourselves approved unto God. That is the purpose that anybody should study, but not everybody studies for that purpose. And what it bumps into is people are not workmen that Instead, they're not workmen, they're lazy, and they need to be ashamed, and they're wrongly dividing the word of truth, which, come on, you can't mix truth. There's no such thing as mixed truth. You either have truth or falsehood. If you have a half a truth, it's not a truth anymore. It's either an opinion or it's a lie. So in both cases, so you're looking for correct doctrine in the Bible for what purpose? to get approval from God, 2 Timothy 2.15. Reading verses in context is vitally important, as I just mentioned, to correct truth and doctrine in the Bible. For what purpose? To get approval from God. If that's your motive, then that's a great motive. When me and Carlos uh, talked, you know, many times on the phone, I could see that his spirit was that uh, uh, was that of a spirit that wanted approval from God. Now, now, uh, approval from God doesn't come from your heart, doesn't come from your emotions. It comes from the word of God. You line up your ideas with the word of God and if your ideas come crumbling down. You've got to lose those ideas and stick with the word of God. That's going to be vitally important, especially when we're covering this word begotten. We can't go by what we think, what we think it means. We got to go by what it acts, the Bible actually teaches about it. So think about this. Homonyms. Are you familiar with homonyms? Homonyms are words that are spelt the same but have different meanings. And the Bible contains many homonyms just as your English language contains homonyms. You can look up any word um, in the English language in a dictionary and you'll find, depending on the context, you're using it as a verb, an adjective, a noun, uh, you'll find a different definition or rendering or uh, of the definition of that word concerning uh, how you're using uh, that word. So I think that's uh, very important to note. And I think a lot of carnal Christians and a lot of lost people don't give the Bible the benefit of the doubt to be able to have homonyms, to ha actually look up a word and understand that it has multiple definitions. And that's the folly that most people end up in, and especially carnal Christians. And then they walk away from the Lord, having been in error, not learning how to read their Bible. Uh, people read the Bible like they read no other book. Um, nobody reads a library book the way they read the Bible. I mean, you read the library book, you give the library book the benefit of the doubt, say, well, I just opened up in the middle of the library book and I read this, but I can't assume the conclusion based upon one sentence that I read. I need to read the whole book to basically understand everything that's being said in the book. But we don't give God the benefit of the doubt in his holy Bible. Why not? Because a lot of times we have an agenda and carnal Christianity definitely has an agenda to try to avoid as much teaching that can correct their lives as they can. And we don't want to be of those people. We want God to correct us as much as he can correct us and as much as we are willing to let him correct us. And notice that it goes hand in hand. God will correct, but we've got to let him correct by getting in the Bible and getting under solid uh, preaching from the Bible, okay? So saved, let's, let's cover some homonyms here. Saved has three biblical definitions at least. I'm not conclusive about that. Baptism, there's seven biblical definitions of baptism at least. Uh, repentance, 
Now, when I did a study on this, I found at least seven biblical definitions of repentance. Evil, evil has at least six biblical definitions. Uh, begotten, you know, now that's the one we're actually on right now. Uh, that has three biblical definitions, at least. Now, I'm not conclusive to a lot of these, but you have to give the Bible, the benefit of the doubt, if God is defining a word a certain way that's not defined in your dictionary, that's not defined in your common tongue in what you speak today. But what do people do when they go to the Bible? They, they go to the Bible in the idea that God is speaking on the level of the English Western culture and the language we're speaking today. And when you go to the Bible and you think it's an, an Western book, you're going to end up in a lot of error. So let's be careful. The Bible isn't an American book. It is a more of a Middle Eastern book, but you have to read context to get correct rendering of verses. So don't pull verses out of context. So I'll give you one example, Jehovah Witnesses. This would be a great study for Jehovah Witnesses. As we're covering more and more, we're getting deeper into this begotten topic. You'll see a very, very great refute for Jehovah Witnesses who wrongly divide the word begotten. So I'm not going to get into contronyms. Contronyms are kind of similar to homonyms. Contronyms are words that are spelt the same, but have contradictory meanings. And sometimes in the Bible, you can deal with a contronym as well. So I think that's pretty decent for the opening there. Uh, we want to give God the benefit of the doubt. Uh, but I will say this uh, that I've wrote, written down for a part of my opening. Because of different false Bibles and the allowance of continually making different kinds of false Bibles. Many cults and religions are reinforced by these man-made false Bibles that have some truth mixed with lies. With the King James Bible as our final authority, we are able to recognize the falsehood and contradictions in these false Bibles and in these cults and religions that get or affirm their beliefs according to these false Bibles. You need the one true Bible. Isaiah 34, 16, we said it. Proverbs 30, verse 5, every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. And we have a book in our hands today. Uh, the King James Bible is that very word of God that's pure. 2 Timothy 3, 16, uh, all scriptures given by inspiration of God. Not all books are given by inspiration of God. But if God gave you a book and he preserved that inspiration, then certainly you can get that King James Bible today as your final authority and change your life. And you know, come on, believe in every word of God is pure, uh, trusting all scripture given by inspiration of God. Your life can be inspired. Your life could be pure. That's what the word of God can do in your life. So this study on one word in the Bible will expose how important it is to have the word of God, the King James Bible, as our final authority and will prove that God has his own built-in dictionary in the Bible that gives his signature of authentication upon his word that we can trust with our hearts and with our souls and with our mind and with our strength that this book that we have in our hands is the very word of God. Let's do it. Begotten, begotten. Now, concerning Jesus and Mary, now we want to define begotten and everybody and their mom wants to give you a, their own definition of what begotten means, uh, especially when you go to these cults. But begotten concerning Mar Jesus and Mary, think about this. It can't mean Mary only had one son. Now, that's if you take begotten as meaning, like Jehovah Witnesses mean, that being begotten means Jesus is the only son, right? In your NIV, in your RSV, and all those other different versions, uh, it'll say, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. That is not correct. And so what we're doing is we're refuting these ideas, these false ideas of begotten. So begotten concerning Jesus and Mary can't mean Mary only had one son. Okay, Mary had other sons. Now, I'm going to kind of fly through these because we, we got a lot to cover here. But uh, later, when you go back in the broadcast, maybe you can write these references down. Jesus was a son of Mary. Okay, that's our you know, beginning point. Acts 114. James the Less, that's, that was his name, James the Less, was a son of Mary as well. It would be Jesus's brother in Mary. 
Uh, that's Matthew 13, 55, Mark 6, 3, uh, Mark 15, 40, uh, Mark 16, 1, Luke 24, 10. Joseph was a son of Mary. That would be Jesus' brother as well. Matthew 13, 55, Mark 6, 3, Mark 15, 40, Mark 15, 47. Simon was a son of Mary. Matthew 13, 55, Mark 6, 3, Judas was a son of Mary. This is not, this was not Judas Iscariot. This was Judas, another Judas, was a son of Mary. Matthew 13, 55, Mark 6, 3. Now, if you go to Mark 6, 3 as well, you'll find that Jesus also had sisters. We don't know their names. I've never found their names doing a Bible study on that, but uh, it does reference that Jesus did have sisters. Now, these were, and we're not going to go down this road. I'm just going to make a comment about that. These were not cousins, but his mother's children, because uh, many, you know, other false uh, teachers and preachers, uh, including those of the Catholic Church, uh, they would like to tell you that all those verses, because they want to maintain their false doctrine of the immaculate conception and so forth, you know, that Jesus never had other children or not, not Jesus, but Mary never had other children, that Jesus was uh, the only son, right? And thus you get the NIV rendering and all that. Um, it says in Psalm 69, 8, and I'll read this to you. You can look at it later. I am become a stranger unto my brethren and an alien unto my mother's children. My mother's children. This is a prophecy of the Lord Jesus Christ right here. And David speaking in prophecy prophetically about the Lord Jesus Christ, and he's right there, Jesus Christ. He had, his, mo his mother had other children. So they were not cousins, and that is simply refuted in Psalm 69a. Begotten, let's talk about begotten again, uh, concerning Jesus and God. It can't mean only created son. Why? Because God had other sons. Did God have other sons? Well, let's prove it. Luke 3.38 in your Bible, if you want to turn there. Luke 3.38. We'll do a few of these. Uh, we, we won't have time to do them all. But Luke 3.38 in your Bible. It goes through the, through the, the genealogical line here of Jesus um, from the line of Mary. Okay? And through this genealogy, it ends right here in Luke 3.38, which was the son of Enos, which was the son of Seth, which was the son of Adam, which was the what? The son of God. So God had other sons, right? Uh, Genesis 6, 2 is another one. Um, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. So angels are sons of God. You got cross references for that in Job 1, 6, Job 2, 1, and Job 38, 7. The children of Israel in Hosea 1.10, if you want to turn there. Uh, children of Israel in Hosea 1.10. Let's read that one. Hosea chapter 1, verse 10. Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured nor numbered. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, ye are not my people, there it shall be said unto them, ye are the what? The sons of the living God. Are the children of Israel the sons of God? Am I just making that up? Or does it actually say that? It actually says that. So we are to assume what the Bible says to be true is true. So Adam is a son of God. Angels are sons of God. Children of Israel are sons of God. Now look at born again Christians in John chapter 1, verse 12. John chapter 1, verse 12. The book of John chapter 1, verse 12. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Now, question, who were the sons of God in John 1, 12? As many. So anybody that would receive Jesus Christ would become a son of God. So we, we lump some, this whole idea of begotten concerning Jesus and God, um, as Jesus is a son of God, right? Adam is a son of God, Luke 3.38. Angels are sons of God, Genesis 6.2. Children of Israel are sons of God, Hosea 1.10. Born again Christians are sons of God, John 1.12, Philippians 2.15, 1 John 3, 1 to 2, and Romans 8.14. 8, 8, 8, so we got four points that we can deliver to the false doctrine of those that would want begotten to only mean only created son. See, we just refuted that.
Now, there's many more ideas that Jehovah Witnesses and other cults will go to. That's why we're covering all of these angles. Look at the next the next uh, topic that uh, your cults would like to go to. Well, wasn't Isaac begotten? So Isaac being begotten meant he was the only created son of Abraham, right? Only created son of Abraham. That's what that's where they're going to go when they're going to talk to you about that. So begotten concerning Isaac can't mean only created son. Now, Genesis 22, 2 would be the go to passage. So let's go there and read it real quickly. Genesis 22, 2. And he said, take now thy son, thine only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest. All right. Now go down to verse 12. And he said, lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son from me. Then go down to verse 16, same chapter. And said, but by myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing, thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son. Now, with that idea, with that idea, it's thine only son right i want you to i want you to pay attention to this if you go back to the first uh reference i gave and he said take now thy son thine only son isaac if you stop right there you can make that say whatever you want it you could just you know cherry pick a verse and just uh cherry pick it out of the verse itself and just take one little uh comment out of the verse which would you could really be an error doing that but look what it really says there he he said take now thy son thine only son isaac comma whom thou lovest you see that this is the son whom abraham lovest that's what it means by thine only son. Now, now, now watch, we're gonna do it again. Go down to verse 16. It says, look towards the end. Thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, colon. See the colon there. If we stop right there in verse 16 of Genesis 22, we can really make that, define that any which way we want. But if we look at the colon and continue on, because what's after the colon is descriptive of what's before the colon, you got some rules of grammar there, that you could read verse 17 and see what is meant by thy son, thy only son. What is meant? Look at verse 17, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. Stop right there. We could keep reading. There's more to this promise. But this is the son of promise. This isn't just thine only son. This is the son that would receive the blessing and the promises that God has given to Abraham. See, those promises would be passed on. So begotten doesn't only mean procreate, which Jehovah Witnesses will tell you. Uh, Jesus is the only created being. He was the first being to be created. And that is wrong, my friend. Jesus, now, now, now mind you, we don't want to fall into the ditch on either side of this thing, okay? Jesus' body and we're going to get into this. Jesus's body was prepared for him. And there was a moment in time when that body was created. So in that sense of the incarnation of Jesus Christ, he would be begotten in the sense of being procreated in the sense of Jesus incarnated in that human body of flesh. Now, that human body of flesh, you got to be careful not to compare that to our human bodies of flesh. He had a body of flesh fit for the, 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 the cross work that he was going to do. So don't compare, okay? Uh, don't fall into the ditch on this thing when we talk about it, okay? So we talked a little bit about Abraham here, but I want to prove something to you as well. Begotten concerning Isaac can't mean only created son. Now, we talked a little bit about what it actually meant um, in the context, but look at this. Ishmael was a son of Abraham. 
Genesis 16, 16. Zimram was the son of Abraham. Genesis 25, 1 to 2. Jokshan was the son of Abraham. Genesis 25. Medan was the son of Abraham. Genesis 25. Midian was the son of Abraham. Genesis 25. Ishbak and Shua were sons of Abraham. All these children were sons of Abraham, which means Isaac wasn't his only created son. You would be in error if you said that. Therefore, when we read the passage in Genesis 22 and we line it up, now you can turn there in your Bible right now, go to Hebrews 11, 17, Hebrews 11, 17. Now this will make sense when you read it or when a Jehovah Witnesses reads it to you, you can, you have all the references you need. Look what it says in Hebrews eleven seventeen. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac and that he had received Listen, the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. See that? Look at verse 19. Look at verse 19. Accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. How about that? He is not only the promised seed that would receive the promises, meaning he's begotten the one that would receive the promises, the chosen son, the exalted son, but that he would be received in a figure, a typology of Jesus Christ. Wouldn't that be neat if somebody told you that, or, or not somebody, but that God would tell you, <laughs> and you would be a testimony in a Bible to Jesus Christ? What an amazing thing right there. Praise the Lord. So what did we cover a little bit right here? We covered begotten concerning Jesus and Mary. We talked about how, uh, you know, Jesus had, Mary had other sons. And how begotten can't mean Mary only had one son. We talked about begotten concerning Jesus and God. That uh, you can't say that, you know, Jesus is God's only created son, because that wouldn't be right, because we read that there's other sons of God in the Bible. We, we talked about begotten concerning Isaac, which can't mean only created son, because Abraham had other sons, which means the Isaac being begotten meant what the Bible says it meant, which was the son of promise. You see that? See, see how we did that? Uh, we're not twisting the Bible to make it say what we want it to say, we're reading the Bible for what it actually says and letting God define his terms. So begotten concerning Jesus, let's do it again. Begot another false angle, begotten concerning Jesus can't mean his firstborn because God has other firstborn. Come on, doesn't the Jehovah Witness love to go to Colossians and show you how Jesus is the firstborn, right? Don't they do that? No, they love that verse. And they don't read even the verse itself in the context of Colossians. They won't read the whole, the whole chapter to show what it means by begotten or firstborn. Now, look at this. Um, we have Exodus 4.22 to 23. Go ahead and turn there. Exodus 4.22. Exodus 4.22. Now, Look at all the truth we're covering just on one word. Isn't it amazing? One word. And it's in the Bible. Everything that I'm dealing with is in the Bible. We're not dealing with philosophy. We're not dealing with man's devices. Only the Bible. But look what Exodus 4.22 says. And thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, thus saith the Lord. So the Lord is telling Moses to say this to Pharaoh, right? Israel is my son even my firstborn. Now, if Jesus is God's firstborn, and that means he's born first and the first created being, well, you got a huge problem. You got a contradiction in your Bible, which I don't believe the Bible has contradictions. I believe our understanding going to the Bible has contradictions if we're not lined up rightly divided in the Bible. So Israel is God's firstborn, but yet Jesus is God's firstborn. Now go to Jeremiah 31 9. Come on, we're going to build this thing up here. Jeremiah 31 9. Jeremiah 31 9. Now look at this. They shall come with weeping and with supplications will I lead them. I will cause them to walk by the rivers of waters in a straight way wherein they shall not stumble for I am a father to Israel. And Ephraim, Ephraim, 
is my firstborn. Now, is Jesus Christ the firstborn, or is Israel the firstborn, or is Ephraim the firstborn? And the answer to all those questions is yes. <laughs> we just got to define what firstborn means. Okay, now we do another one here, one more here for firstborn. Look at Psalm 89.27. Psalm 89.27. Okay, hold on. Did I get a, uh, okay, here it is. Uh, go back to verse 26. He shall cry unto me, thou art my father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. Also, I will make him my, what? Firstborn. Firstborn. Higher than the kings of the earth. See that? Now, who's that talking about? Look at Psalm 8920. Just go back a few verses there. Psalm 8920. I have found David, my servant, with my holy oil, have I anointed him. So the context is David. That's the context. So God, the Lord God, is calling David his firstborn. Question, is Israel, Ephraim, David, or Jesus God's firstborn? All those verses are absolutely right. We just need to understand what firstborn means. Now, can, do we have do we have time? I think we have time to do this. Go to go to First Chronicles five one. First Chronicles five one. I want you to see this. Look at this very carefully. Then we're going to hit the Colossians passage because we need to get through this really quickly, okay? Because um, I, I still have a whole lot to cover here. Uh, really great truths. First Chronicles five one says, "Now the sons of Reuben, the now look the firstborn of Israel, for he was the firstborn." Come on, in, in reality, in fact, in birth, he was the firstborn. But for as much as he defiled his father's bed, his birthright was given unto the sons of Joseph, the son of Israel. Now watch this. Look at the change and how God deals with the nation of Israel concerning firstborn. And the genealogy is not to be reckoned after the birthright. Do you see that? God said, that the birthright was not to be reckoned after if somebody was born first. Hmm, interesting, isn't it? First Samuel 16, 7, the Lord seeth not as man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. That's how God chooses people concerning the nation of Israel to take that blessing. Huh? The blessing that would be passed from Abraham on down as a promise to the nation of Israel. Huh? Ain't, ain't, come on. Isn't how God deals with that? Praise the Lord. So what do we learn right now? We learn that firstborn doesn't necessarily mean that you were born first. <laughs> it's the one that God chooses, the one that God exalts. Interesting. So let's do this. Um, I'm typing this in. I didn't have this in my notes. But I did want to cover this because it is very important um, if we want to understand this a little bit better concerning the firstborn. And let's see if I, okay, go to Colossians chapter 1. Go to Colossians chapter 1, and then I want you to go to verse 15. Look at this very carefully. Now, we can't, I would like to read the whole chapter, but for the sake of time, we got so much to cover. And I have 20 minutes left because uh, Carlos uh, allotted me an hour. So uh, bear with me. We're going to get as much as we can in. Uh, verse 15 Who is the image of the invisible God? The firstborn of every creature. Stop right there. The Jehovah Witness said, tells you Jesus Christ is the firstborn of every creature, He's the first created being. The problem is, is there's a colon. Do you remember our rules of grammar when we dealt with the colon? Everything after the colon is descriptive what's before the colon. So you don't stop there, and that's what people love to do. They love to stop in a verse, and then they end up in error, right? So look at the firstborn of every creature right there in verse 15, and let's keep going under that topical of the firstborn of every creature. Let's get understanding here. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. Well, that's what it means for him to be the firstborn of every creature. Let's keep going because there's another colon there. He is before all things, 
and by him all things consist. Verse 18, look at this knockout punch if somebody, if a Jehovah's Witness ever goes and uses that verse to you. Look at this. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning. Now look, this is what it means, the firstborn of creation. The firstborn from the dead. <laughs> That's what it means. It doesn't mean he was created being. It means he's the firstborn from the dead, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, do you see a truth that we're bringing to the table? Because I wasn't supposed to bring this truth because I'm, I'm putting the cart before the horse right now, and I shouldn't. But uh, I wanted you to see that because we were already on the topic of talking about it. But when you read that in its context, you can define what it means to be the firstborn of every creature and go to verse 18 and tell them, define it, tell them what it means. Now, with that being said, we had covered a few major things that are going to draw into the important part of this study. Okay, just bear with me. Everything's going to be building up. We're going to, all these principles are going to fall into place that we talked about, and you're going to see that it fits together like a puzzle, and there's no contradictions in the Bible. Okay, here we go. Begotten defined in three definitions, and we already covered a few. Begotten defined as raised from the dead. When Christ was raised from the dead, the Bible calls this firstborn from the dead, right? Didn't we just read that? Colossians 1.18. When, when we are raised from the dead, the Bible calls this born again concerning our soul. We are not firstborn from the dead. See, that's the difference between us and Jesus Christ. Psalm 2, 7, and I'm not going to go through all these verses with you. I'm going to give you the references and you can do the study yourself. Psalm 2, 7, how do we know if this is dealing with his virgin birth or his resurrection? Psalm 2, 7 will cross-reference Acts 13, 33, because it is brought to the table again, Psalm 2, 7. Hebrews 1, 5, God resurrected Jesus. This day have I begotten thee. That's what it says in Hebrews 1, 5. Revelation 1, 5. Jesus is the first begotten from the dead, right? Colossians 1.14, the one we just read. Jesus is the firstborn of every creature, the firstborn from the dead, which is resurrection. So what do we just define right there? Begotten defined as raised from the dead or resurrection. Now, look at the second definition. Begotten defined as exalted position or exalted son. Remember, we defined that with Abraham earlier and Isaac. The eternal word was made human flesh. The eternal God incarnated a body of flesh. Okay? That whole incarnation we talked about is called begotten. You just got to define that in the context. It's what it's presenting in the verse. The eternal word, his human name was Jesus, Matthew 121, who is the only exalted son which is begotten, John 3.16. See, now when we read John 3.16, there's more understanding of it. But I'm going to even give you more understanding of John 3.16 as we cover even more. Philippians 2, 5 to 10 as well. The eternal word was not always known as the Son of God. The eternal word became the Son of God. Ooh, oh, that's pretty controversial because I've always believed that Jesus was always the Son of God. But that's not true, not according to the word of God. We've got to put away our preconceived ideas, what we were taught, what we, what we learned over the years when we were lost and undone, what we learned through pastors that may not have been learned in the Bible. We need to take away all the falsehood, and we need to go to the word of God and prove what God says in the scriptures. That way we can have a right rendering of who God really is. And so when I make statements like Jesus was not always the son of God, uh, people uh, start hoisting up the red flags because they don't know the Bible well enough to know that he was not always the son of God. There was a point in time when he became the son of God. Now, let's go ahead and dive into some of this. Um, we talked about Jesus Christ uh, having the exalted position or known as the exalted son for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, the, his only exalted and uh, 
uh, son of promise and favorite, his favorite son, his exalted son. Okay, that's what we mean by that. Now, John 3, 16, Jesus did not die on the cross yet, and Jesus was called God's only begotten son, which means that the plan of God giving the eternal word to the world in the form of Jesus, Philippians 2, 5 to 10, means that Jesus was exalted before his resurrection, John 17, 5, which says, and now, O Father, glorify thou me with a glory or, or glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had before thee, or which I had with thee before the world was. See that? So Jesus had glory, and he wasn't Jesus. He was called the eternal word. He had glory before he became Jesus. See that? We're talking about the eternal word, who later became Jesus, Matthew one twenty one. So there was a, a, a starting point where he became Jesus, where he was known as Jesus, right? So uh, next point here, John 3, 16, John 17, 5 again, Philippians 2, 5 to 10 again. He's the only exalted begotten son. Point three, Colossians 1, 18, we covered that. In all things, Jesus, well, actually, we didn't cover uh, that specific uh, verse. We read half of it, uh, that in all things, Jesus would have the preeminence. Now, Look, look at what it says. Go, go to Colossians 1.18. I like to hit this one. Colossians 1.18. This is really interesting. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, semicolon, that in all things he might have the preeminence. That's the end of the matter. There's a period there. The end of the matter is that in all things he would have the preeminence. The preeminence means he is the exalted one. So you see that we have a definition of firstborn from the dead, which is begotten, which means that he would have the preeminence, which means he's exalted. <laughs> Amen. It all ties together. All right. So we did that one. Uh, firstborn of every creature. We said that that's begotten. Uh, Hebrews 5, 5. God made Jesus a uh, high priest, making Jesus begotten as an exalted high priest. Hebrews 5.5, 5, I'll read it to you. So also Christ glorified not himself to be made an high priest, that, but, he say, but, but he that said unto him, listen, thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. There was a point in time when it says this day have I begotten thee. You see that? He wasn't always begotten. There was a point in time when he says this day have I begotten thee. Hebrews 5.5, 5. that is a cross-reference in Psalms, which we're going to cover in a minute. Romans 1.4 says, he's the son of God with power. That's Colossians 1.18, that in all things, he might have the preeminence, right? And it was through the resurrection of the dead. That's uh, Romans 1.4, uh, coupled with Colossians 1.18. Uh, Psalm 2.7, Acts 13.33, we covered those. This day have I begotten the exalted position of sonship. We don't believe in eternal sonship, but we do believe in the sonship of the Lord Jesus Christ, the exalted position of sonship. Absolutely. Uh, Hebrews 1, 3, the son being the express image of his person by power, his power purged our sins. So we're dealing with the exalted position of sonship by resurrection. Hebrews 1, 3. Look at this one. Uh, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. I know we like to use the whole thing, you know, by the word of his power, and we apply that to creation. But do you know the context right there? That's dealing with his resurrection. He holds all things by the word of his power concerning his resurrection. How can I trust the resurrection to be uh, vitally crucial to my salvation? Because it's upheld by the word of his power. Now, I know we like to go to the molecules and the atoms and God holds all those things together. But if we want to go to the context of what it actually means, it's concerning his resurrection. So you see that? Uh, be very careful in the scriptures with how you just cherry pick things and just apply them however you want to apply them. There is a context there. Now, Hebrews 1, 4 says, uh, or is dealing with, the son by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than the angels. Why? Why? Because we have a definition of begotten here that goes beyond just somebody being procreated. This is an exalted position of sonship by resurrection. 
And this is what God has done for Jesus Christ. He's given him that exaltation after his resurrection. Hebrews 1, 5. He shall be, he shall be to me a son. Now look at this. Hebrews 1, 5. He shall be to me a son. Which means what? The word became a son. He wasn't always a son. Do you, did you read the, the verse here? For for unto which of the angels said he at any time, thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee, and again I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Which means he wasn't always a son. So you need to get that out of your head, thinking that Jesus was always the eternal son in the Old Testament. He wasn't. All the prophecies of the Old Testament, when it calls Jesus a son, is dealing uh, with, with the incarnation of Jesus Christ in a future time, calling this fully God, fully man. He's not a demigod. He's not 50% God, 50% man, fully 100% God, fully 100% man, that this was the moment where he became the son of God. Mm, pretty interesting. Hebrews 1 covers that pretty, pretty in depth and in detail. Hebrews 1, 6, why are angels worshiping Jesus? If angels can't worship a lowercase g God, right? Which means he, had, he truly does have the exalted position of sonship that was given to him by the Father after his resurrection from the dead. Hebrews 1, 8 to 9, God the Father exalts the Son on his throne, right? You guys remember that? But unto the Son, he saith, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is a scepter of thy kingdom. So we got God the Father exalting God the Son on his throne. Why? Because it was an exalted position of sonship and righteousness that uh, was resulting from the resurrection from the dead by Jesus Christ. And uh, see if we need to cover any more. I got a lot of these. Hebrews 1, 8, 9. We're not going to read all of these. God the Father exalts the Son on his throne. Exalted position of sonship and righteousness right there. Hebrews 5, 5. Begotten concerning Christ's priesthood that the God, that, uh, the, God the Father bestows upon Jesus, which is an exalted position of priesthood. See, we're just constantly dealing with exalted position concerning begotten. See that? John 17, 5. Um, we covered that one already, but it was an exalted position of deity. Uh, Colossians 1.15, firstborn of every creature. We covered that already. Exalted position by resurrection. Colossians 1.18, covered that one already. Exalted position by resurrection. Romans 1.4, we covered that one. This was by the resurrection from the dead. Exalted position by resurrection. Revelation 1.5, the first begotten of the dead to the exalted position. And the prince of the kings of the earth, the exalted position. Come on, that's Jesus, king of kings, lord of lords, exalted position. Revelation 1, 6, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Exalted position by resurrection, right? John 12, 23, the hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. See, what is that? Exalted position by resurrection. Let's do it again. Begotten defined as procreate. That is in the Bible, believe it or not. I know we want to go polar opposite of the Jehovah Witness and just say, well, wait a minute. There's uh, Begotten doesn't mean procreate. Because it means res the firstborn of every creature, resurrection from the dead, so forth, right? We want to go polar opposite and say, well, there's nowhere in the Bible where begotten means procreate, meaning created being. Well, you better be careful with that. You need to be rightly divided. Yes, there is a definition in the Bible where begotten means created being. Go to Judges 8.30. Judges 8.30. Judges chapter 8, verse 30. Now, look at this definition here. And Gideon had three score and ten sons of his body begotten. <laughs> For he had many wives. Okay, we're not getting into moral claims right now, but, um, but we're definitely covering the whole topic of begotten right now. I'm just trying to show you in the Bible that there is a definition in the Bible, and there's only one that I found as far as begat. So you have begat and you have begotten which means procreate or generate. Um, and God uh, allots for that definition in the Bible. So be careful uh, when you handle uh, the Bible, words in the Bible. So Judges 8.30 would be your go-to passage to show that uh, there is a procreation uh, that 
uh, is that's dealt with in the Bible of somebody being born um, from the womb, and that would be begotten. Okay, so now I want to draw that definition of procreate into Jesus Christ, because right, we want to know what begotten means concerning Jesus Christ. Now we covered the we covered the resurrection from the dead, right? We covered exalted position. And now our last one is the procreate. Now, um, I can see I probably have a few minutes left here. Uh, I got four minutes on my clock here. So we'll try to uh, make this last part good. So we have Jesus Christ, Luke 135, Luke 135. Uh, the Bible says that holy thing, that holy thing, look at Luke 135. I'll actually read this one to you. And the angel answered and said unto her, the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the son of God. Now, what is this holy thing? It's not Jesus, but it's what's procreated for Jesus. Okay, let's go a step further. Hebrews 10, five will define that for you. Hebrews chapter 10, verse five. The Bible says, wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not. Now watch, but a body hast thou prepared me, a body. So what was procreated? What is the holy thing? It is that body that was prepared for Jesus Christ. Now, was that body procreated? Yes. Was that body created for Jesus? Yes. Jesus is not the body, but Jesus, whose deity, come on, he wasn't Jesus yet. He was the holy, the eternal holy word came down and then incarnated into that holy thing. And then he became Jesus, fully God, fully man. And that moment when that happened, that incarnation that happened will never change. He will always remain in that body of flesh. Okay. That is a glorified body of flesh now, but Isaiah 7, 14, uh, there's deity inside of human flesh. Isaiah 9, 6, uh, the child is born. He is called the mighty God, the everlasting father. And it's too bad. We can't uh, cover the everlasting father versus uh, the eternal father. Uh, the Bible calls Jesus the everlasting father because he had a starting point and no ending point. See that? Everlasting, really quick. I got two minutes. Everlasting, really quick. Everlasting means you have a starting point, but no ending point. Eternal means you have no starting point and no ending point. Do you see how words matter? Words really matter. So when, when you get everlasting life, it means you're a human being. Only human beings can get everlasting life because at one time we were lost and undone. And then the moment we believe the gospel that Christ died for our sins and rose again a third day, we pass from death unto life. There's a starting point, but there's never an ending point. That's why it's everlasting. But what else? This is the blessing. What else do we get? We get eternal life as well, right? John 3, 15 and 16. That's why we read that. John 3.15 talks about eternal life. John 3.16 talks about everlasting life. But eternal life, what is that? That's Galatians 2.20. That's Ephesians 4.6. That's 1 Corinthians 6.19. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit come to reside within the believer. That's amazing. Why? Because now you have the life of God, which is eternal. You see that? So there's a moment I believed preach, and preach. I passed from death unto life. And then you're good, brother. You're good. Keep going if you want a little bit. And then by believing that Christ died for my sins, rose again the third day, he gives me his life. So I have both. I have eternal life and I have everlasting life. And if you're not saved today, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ for the salvation of your soul, as I covered the gospel a few times in the broadcast. But um overall, begotten is a very important word in the Bible. And if you're not begotten today, I suggest that you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ so you could pass from death unto life, and thus you could be begotten by the gospel, begotten concerning being born again. And if you're already saved, why aren't we looking back to 
us being begotten and living that begotten life that God so graciously given us to be able to live a life that's honoring to him to show the world that we are begotten and the testimony of us being begotten can draw others to be begotten of God by the gospel. So uh, there it is. I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up. I will let, uh, I'll pass it over to Carlos if he would like to uh, do the prayer and everything. Uh, I'll I'll go ahead and pass it over to him. Thanks uh, for allowing me to be able to preach for you you all this evening. And uh, I hope and pray that you'll continue to grow in grace in the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, go ahead, Carlos. Wow. Praise God. (laughs) No, what I, amen, amen. Hold on, hold on, hold on, church, hold on. Okay, do it again, do it again, do it again. There you go, there's all the... <laughs> <laughs> Amen. No, when praise I was the Lord, doing the, glory the to God. Thumbs up, I was just like, hey, you're good, keep going. And then, um, yeah, so praise God. Uh, man, we got uh, definitely edified with that, brother. I Again, that Bible is good. You definitely uh, learn some new things uh, from uh, um, another teacher who can, who can uh, definitely feed us. Uh, from a lot more time uh, and wisdom and experience studying the Bible. And uh, one thing, again, I, I just want to thank God for is uh, just, you know, Brother Ed is, is like a big brother to me in the Lord, where uh, I just like how he, he teaches the scriptures in its context, giving you the definition uh, of a word, and then the topic or the doctrine is built upon the context. And so as you guys saw, we had a lot of examples of begotten, uh, and the firstborn. So that's going to equip you now with your defense on how to defend Bible against the cults, especially the Jehovah's Witnesses, like he did mention, because they will try to get at us with arguing, well, aren't you a son to your father? How can Jesus be? And then so now you know, you, you got a defense now. And uh, But really what was pumping me up towards the end is when he was just saying, we've been begotten by the gospel. That's what the scripture says. And uh, we have everlasting life, but God residing in us eternal life man that's pump i'm not sure about you church but i I think we're gonna need to get a part two and a part three in this series and lord willing of course uh, we definitely gotta ask brother ed and uh, maybe if we sow a seed ahead of time amen we can schedule this brother for the coming months amen and uh we'll uh try to get him so he can do like a series with us on these terms and like in depth and and different like uh you know begotten of the believer you know begotten the son of god begotten of Israel, like, so that way we can learn more Bible on that, because, again, I'm not sure about you, friend, but I sure was edified with uh, learning that we've been begotten by the power of the gospel, and just, just the Godhead residing in us right now, which blows my mind away, we have eternal Amen. life, and uh, praise God right now, it's in us, it abides within us, and that's what Jesus said, amen, so I'll leave you with one verse as we come to a close, and then, of course, we'll have uh, Brother Ed closes in prayer, but go ahead and turn your Bible quickly to the book of John, uh, chapter number 14. And this is one of my favorite verses when we uh, think about uh, this relationship that we have with God. Uh, that is the, the, that reciprocal relationship. He comes into us. I receive him. He comes into us. And I'd just like to show this to you before we uh, close it out. Amen. So in your Bible, uh, John, chapter number 14. And uh, let's come here to verse number 21. Uh, Every so often you'll see these Marines and these people out there with uh, tattoos. And for some reason, they'll have John chapter 14 uh, and uh, some verse in there. Uh, But then I'll I'll prod them a little bit uh, about uh, keeping his commandments, you know, because they're, you know, they're not living it out, right? Amen. Uh, But look at here for the believer. Look at here, verse 21. The Bible says, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Praise God. And uh, if you go down a little bit later, 23, Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him. Look at this. And we, that's the Father and Jesus, we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Isn't that amazing? So crazy to know (laughs) this relationship, God a residing in us eternal life, the life of God literally in us. But the believer, we have a beginning, but now we have everlasting life from that. That just blew my mind away, brother. So we definitely got to get you back here for part two, three, four, uh, however long until glory. Amen. Uh, so with that yeah, said, yeah. anybody have any questions or comments before this evening for Brother Ed that you'd like to ask anybody? 
or any praise, anybody out there. Amen. Brother Felipe is giving you with, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Brother Felipe, one more time. There you go. Amen. All right, there you go. That's sometimes. <laughs> All right. I like this video switcher. So, Brother Ed, would you do me a favor, and would you close us in prayer? And I want to thank God once again for all of our online viewers. Please check out Brother Ed at the KTV Bible Scope. Uh, support uh, the ministry there through his online teaching. as a Monday night Q&A on Facebook. He'll upload it on YouTube. If you send him an email at uh, Trust the Lord Jesus, I think it is, at gmail.com, yes. you can send him questions. He'll answer it for you in a due time. If you sow a seed, you'll probably get first. Amen. Aside uh, from all the other people, no, I'm just fine. But either way, show some love. He comes from uh, the Bible Baptist Church out there in Deland, Florida. Pastor James Knox, great leadership, great teaching extension. So if you would close us out in prayer, brother, I'd really appreciate that. Yes, sir. Uh, dear Holy Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for allowing us to be able to come to your church, to be able to uh, sing praises to you and honor you and glorify you. Uh, Father, I just pray for uh, Pastor Carlos here and his family. Pray that you keep them strong in you. Keep them, keep their eyes focused on the Lord Jesus Christ, as well as the whole church. Father, I thank you for a Simple Faith Baptist Church. Uh, they've been a great testimony to us as well. Pray that you just bless each and every one of them. Bless those that couldn't be there. And uh, Father, I just uh, pray that uh, your seed would be planted in each of their lives, that, uh, Father, that uh, they would grow in grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ each and every day, that, Father, your power of, of your word would reside within every believer in this church. Father, we thank you for their testimony again. Uh, Father, we pray uh, for the growth of this church. We pray for uh, more people desiring for uh, to go to outreach and win souls for the for Jesus Christ. And Father, we just pray for uh, Carlos that he would be strong as well in the church to not be discouraged. Uh, anything uh, that would come into the church, I pray that you would uh, direct those things other directions besides uh, coming into the church, that Father, you keep that church strong in you which we'll give you all the glory and praise in the name of Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen, church. All right. For those of you in the house, thank you so much. And uh, please show some love uh, to Brother Ed. Uh, he is a little overtime, amen, on the eastern side of life. Uh, so praise God. And uh, if you would like to support his ministry, let us know. Uh, we're going to send him a love offering um, as a church to bless him for his work of service. He prepped a lot to give us this. But like I said, we're definitely going to need him to come back for part two, part three, part four series on this word i mean the word of god is so powerful but uh, just one word can can get you uh, so much more meaning and so much more understanding when you just study it out and that's just one word amen we still got many more to go uh so uh let's go ahead and give one last time for brother ed and then everybody go ahead and say wish him good well and say goodbye amen all the way here from the amen. barrio baptist church no, i'm just kidding we're <laughs> in the barrio but uh some way the baptist all right brother the lord bless you and again for all of you online uh, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for hanging with us through all our technical difficulties. I think it was well worth the wait. I'm not sure about you, friend, but uh, I'll make sure to delete all the old videos prior to this particular broadcast. Uh, it's going to be on the Facebook and it's going to be on the YouTube. And uh, Brother Ed, can you just give us uh, your email and then just that Q&A thing if folks ever want to try to reach out to you? Yeah, yeah. Um, I do every Monday night, uh, Florida time, Eastern Standard Time, 8 p.m. Uh, just take account for the time difference because a lot of people watch in different states. So uh, I, right now it's 1141 and it's uh, three hours difference in, in California. So uh, it's pretty late for me right now, but take account for that time. Uh, the email is trust the Lord Jesus at gmail.com. That's trust the Lord Jesus at gmail.com. And if you send your questions there to that email address, instead of posting them on a, on a Facebook or on a YouTube comment section, uh, I can get those questions and we can answer those for you. So uh, Lord willing, I try my best to be on every Monday night. There's been a few times I've been sick, but I try my best to be consistent as well as uh, the other fellas that get on with me, Mike Basile and Brother Justin Whitland. So uh, if you guys would uh, email me there, uh, no cost to get your uh, questions answered. It is a ministry that's for free and we do it. Uh, you would send your, your email there, your question, and then I would spend the week. I'd share the, your email with the other fellas that would answer the question with me. And we would do our best during the week to give a proper uh, Bible study for that question to give it an answer. And then the following Monday, 
we'll do our best to give you an answer to your question. Now, that's just a ministry, not to flex our knowledge or to show how much we know more than everybody else. That's just to be a ministry to help. Um, I wish there was something like that when I was uh, still yet a carnal Christian. But uh, praise the Lord for people that will share their knowledge. And I'm not a Mr. Know-it-all, and I don't claim to be, but uh, with all the knowledge that I have learned under a, a profitable man here at our church, uh, Pastor James Knox, he has shared with me his years and years and years of knowledge that I don't take for granted. And I would want to share that with as many people as I can. And so with the other brothers. So uh, just uh, throw that out there. I hope that you guys uh, consider getting on the Q&A. Uh, again, anybody can get on Facebook live. Uh, just follow me on KJV Bible Scope, either on my Facebook or you can just watch the replays on YouTube. Okay, well, thanks for the opportunity to be able to present that, Carlos. Thanks. Amen. Praise the Lord. So he does get in depth. So I, that's what I love about this brother. I call him Professor Ed because he'll take his time to just answer your question, dig deep to give you that scripture. And so uh, please show some support anytime on his YouTube channel. Subscribe. And uh, but yeah, we sure are thankful, brother. Thank you for hanging in for throughout all our technical glitches. Um, now we kind of uh, now I see some of the things that are going on on this end. So Lord willing, next time it'll be a little bit more smoother for our online crowd. Uh, but uh, yes, I, I think uh, we got a lot of comments there for the keep the series. We got to get a series with you going on so for a future. So we'll talk about that. Uh, but hey, okay. brother. So thank you so much. Have a great rest of your night. Thank you. And uh, you we too. sure look forward to seeing you next time here at Simple Amen. Faith Baptist. Amen. First time we did this service. Amen. So you're our first to break it in. Thank you so much. All right. Lord bless you. All right. Likewise, brother. God bless you. I think it's still there. It's just the, uh, oh yeah, no, that's the, uh, the, uh, the periscope. All right, everybody. Well, thank you for tuning in. The Lord bless you.